Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Recently, maybe a month ago, I had said that I was done reading Neville Goddard lectures, and since then, I've read a new lecture, and I was then fortunate to find a book full of a bunch of lectures I have never heard before. So once again, once I thought I could escape, I've been pulled back in. I found a bunch of amazing new lectures that covered some new material. This one really resonated with me. The Mystery of Imagination, delivered on January 6th, 1969. There's a bunch of interesting tidbits and new stories that I found interesting in the discussion of imagination. The Mystery of Imagination. Tonight's subject is the mystery of imagination. I could have titled it the mystery of God, the mystery of man, the mystery of Christ. It would have been the same thing, but I took for tonight the use of the word imagination. It would not offend, but these three are interchangeable words. So here, I imagine as do you. We cannot imagine differently. All the differences lie in content. And so we ask the little question, who am I? And our response to that question determines content, and there we differ. The whole vast world differs based upon their response to that enormous question which we find in Scripture, who am I? I could tell you that you are God. You wouldn't believe it. You can read it in Scripture, be still and know that I am God. You'll read it in the 46th Psalm. But you won't believe it. If I told you that you are Christ, you might be offended. You may have some external concept of a being, and you call him Christ. When I say that you do imagine, that wouldn't offend you because you know we do imagine. And you may not believe for one moment that this power of imagining is the power of God. But nevertheless, you do imagine. That wouldn't offend anybody. So tonight... We'll take, first of all, we'll start with Blake's Jerusalem. Now, Blake claimed this entire poem was dictated by the spirit of prophecy or the Savior of the world. He said, morning after morning, when I return, I've found the spirit of the Savior spreading his beams of love over me and dictating the words of this mild song. And in this, he said, Babel mocks, saying there is no God nor son of God, that thou, O human imagination, O divine body, art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill, for thou also sufferest with me. And then the divine voice replied, Fear not, lo, I am with thee always. Only believe in me that I have power to raise from death thy brother, who sleepeth in Albion. Now, could you honestly believe to that point that you would say, but I know thee, O Lord, meaning your own wonderful human imagination, no other being, your imagination, the eternal you. Could you say with him that man is all imagination and God is man and he in us and we in him? The eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. Lao Kun, Annotations to Berkeley. Could you believe it? Well, now, let us show you. We are told in Scripture that all things were made through Christ, and without Him was not anything made that was made, but all things, good, bad, and indifferent. Now, who made this? The year is 1951, my brother-in-law, because he married to my wife's sister, called and asked if I could see him that evening. It was very important. He knew that we were sailing for Barbados in about two weeks, and he wanted to see me before we sailed. So he came home. This was his problem. First, I'll give you his background. He graduated from Harvard, and then remained on and took the business course at Harvard, Harvard Business School's graduate course. Came out of college and went straight into the bank. The Bank of New York. Well, as you know, banks have different departments, and some departments do not advance rapidly. He was in the trust department. That is almost a service. That is not a money-making section of the bank. So he was in the trust department. And after 18 years, he concluded that traveling as he's traveling now 
at the bank, he couldn't see how he could possibly put his two children through college. He went through college, and his wife went through Smith, and he couldn't see how he could possibly put these two children through college. They were bright, desired to go to college, but with that fixed salary, he couldn't see how he could do it. So he went to the president and the manager of the bank and explained the facts of life. The intern reminded him that the department did not allow any further increases in salary, that eventually someone would resign or someone would retire. Someone would leave the bank or they may die. In that event, he would be promoted, but without this, he had to remain and move forward just as they all do in the banks. They made it very, very clear to him that if he didn't like it, he could quit. Now, he said, that's my problem, I said. All right. First of all, I'll tell you, he was at the time and still is the head usher of a very prominent Fifth Avenue church, the Church of the Ascension. He was on the financial board because he was a banker and could advise them on how to invest their funds and raise funds. But he couldn't find any comfort in an interview with his minister. The minister didn't know what to say to him, how to solve this problem. I said to Sam, you know, Sam, that I'm leaving in a couple weeks and will be gone for about three months. Will you do this? I assure you it will work. It will not fail you if you do it. You are the operant power. It doesn't operate itself. I can tell you from now to the ends of time, but if you don't operate it by becoming the operant power, it won't work. But if you actually do what I'm going to ask you to do, I tell you that it will work. Well, he said, tell me. I said, when you go to bed tonight, I don't mean tomorrow night or the next night. I mean tonight and every night thereafter. You feel as though you had the most heavenly day in business, that you invested fantastic funds. By the by, I must tell you that I asked him, what would you like to do? Well, he said, I'm trained to invest funds. I know the money market. I would like to handle the funds of a great foundation like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, the Rockefellers or the Fords. That's the kind of thing I would like. I said, all right, as you sleep tonight, you feel this is the most heavenly day, the most wonderful day. What a portfolio and what I did with it. This enormous sum of money that you invested and feel that you've never known such a wonderful day in your business. He started that night. We sailed to Barbados and returned three months later. As is our custom, that very first day, they always came home for dinner. So the wife came first and he had a round of drinks, and she said, Let's wait for Sam. I want Sam to be here before we have any drinks. I said, All right, we'll wait for Sam. So Sam came in straight from the bank. And when he came in, I made a round of martinis, and Sam rose and said, Dear, did you tell them? She said, No, it's your story. I want you to tell them. Well, this is the story. Being a member of the financial board of the church, this meeting was held two weeks after we sailed. At the end of the meeting, when... They came to the sidewalk, this man who handles all the funds of the Rockefeller brothers, not the Rockefeller Foundation. It's something entirely different. The five brothers and their sisters, and then their wives and children. The fund runs well in excess of a billion dollars. It's just their private funds. The man said, Sam, I've been thinking of this for the last couple of weeks. Right on the heels of Sam beginning to put this into practice, he entertains the thought and said to Sam, Would you consider quitting the bank? I know you have to lose all the seniority, lose all that you've built up in the bank. I can't give you that. I'll start you at a much, much bigger salary and guarantee you an increase in salary every year. But what an opportunity. Here you have a portfolio well in excess of a billion dollars. And I'm asking you to quit the bank and join me and help me with the Rockefeller money. He said, I can't say yes to it now, but I'll go home and discuss it with my wife. Well, they agreed that it was quite a challenge. And so they would do it. The bank was thrilled beyond measure that the Rockefellers would see in one of their men that they trained one with that ability. And they were just all smiles, all love. When one broke forth, they almost offered him to quit. Now they're thrilled beyond measure because he could throw some business in their direction. Handling one portfolio one day, $394 million, at the same time, a $4,000 investment. Some grandchild just got an A or B or something in school. And he was given four thousand dollars he had to take that four thousand and be just as careful with that investment as the 394 million dollars that he was one day switching in a certain portfolio well that was sam i wrote a book a year later 1952 in which i told this story i did it without sam's consent or knowledge 
knowing the story I wrote the story myself and simply signed his initials, as is my custom. I bring out a new book and I always give Sam a copy. Sam took the book and he saw this story. Now he's entranced, mind you, in this. He still is a powerhouse in his church. He knows exactly what he did and he knows how it works, but that book was hidden. When I called on Sam the next time, there was no discussion of this theory and the book was not available. All my other books were put away. You couldn't find one of my books in Sam's house today because to him this is irrational. Some friend of this in the social world may come to his apartment and see a book and think by the title or take it from the library, see Sam's story in the book, and that would embarrass him. He's very prominent in his own mind's eye in the social world and in the banking world, in these worlds. So he denied I introduced him to Christ. He goes to church every Sunday morning, is the head usher, doesn't know Christ. I introduced him to Christ and proved to him the existence of Christ in him. For all things are made clear by Christ, and without him is not anything made that is made. And who made it? He dared to imagine himself returning from a job where everything was perfect, just as he wanted it. In two weeks, the offer came out of the blue. The man began to entertain the thought of suggesting it to Sam soon after Sam began to go to bed at night after a night imagining that he had such a job. Now he buries the evidence, the old, old story. He denies the ladder by which he did ascend. Oh no, that's not. So I introduced him to Christ. He met Christ and did not recognize him and did what you're told in scripture. He denied him. He rejected Christ, although he goes every Sunday and ushers them down the aisle. There he is in his cutaway, leading in that manner. Now I'll tell you the story in scripture that is related to it. He who is not with me is against me. Luke eleven twenty three. There is no room for neutrality, none whatsoever. In this conflict, you are either with me or against me. Now he makes that bold statement and then it seems irrelevant what follows. And this is what he states in the book of Luke, the 11th chapter. When an evil spirit, an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it wanders through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I'll return to the house from which I came. When he comes to the house, he finds it swept and put in order. Verse 24, he goes and gets seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they come and they enter and dwell in that house and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Verse 26. Now a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and blessed the breasts you sucked. He replied, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Here is a man brought into the very presence of the only creative power in the world, his own wonderful human imagination, his eternal being who is Christ Jesus in him. He tests him and proves his creative power to the full satisfaction. He tests him, and Christ proved himself in performance, and then he buries the evidence. He wants no part of it, none whatsoever. It isn't socially prominent. It will do nothing for him in the social world to have that story heard concerning him. So having turned his back upon Christ, he'll be confronted tomorrow next year, I use the word loosely, and he will forget what he did to get the job with the Rockefellers. He held it for eight years, and then his boss quit. And as is the custom, when the new boss came in, he brought his own personnel, so Sam was out. But because of eight years' service in that capacity, he was offered all kinds of jobs, and he took a junior partnership in a brokerage house. So now he's a partner in a brokerage house, doing remarkably well. A man my age, in fact, the same month in the same year. We never discussed this principle at all. He wants his own archaic concept of a man he calls Christ Jesus. He doesn't want a living Christ within himself that is his own wonderful human imagination. He doesn't want that. No, he wants something that is historical, something that happened 2,000 years ago. And that, to him, is Christ. I introduce you to Christ. It is customary that you reject him. I can tell you it's not the easiest thing in the world having once been trained in an orthodox manner to believe 
and an eternal Christ to suddenly find that he's your own wonderful human imagination. That this is the eternal you, the immortal you, the one that cannot die. And one that you can put to the test every moment of time. So when Blake said, Thou also sufferest with me, although I do not behold thee, you never behold him as another. He will one day, through a series of events, reveal himself as you. Because these events are only related to Christ Jesus, and only as these events are experienced by you, and you are cast in the central role, will you know who you are. So you never see him as another. As told us in Scripture, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall know him because we shall be like him. 1 John 3, 2. So when he appears, I am he. So you'll know by a series of events which you will experience who you really are. Until then, you will know him, but you will not behold him because you don't behold him. He is God the Father, and you can only behold him in the face of his Son. You beholding the Son, knowing the Son is your Son, then you know who you are, that you are God the Father. But long before you know and behold yourself, as God the Father. You can know Him. So I can bring you this night as I have. I've brought you this night and I introduced you to Jesus Christ. You can call Him Jesus Christ. I do. You can call Him as Blake in Jerusalem calls Him the Lord. But I know Thee, O Lord, when Thou arisest upon my weary eyes. Here yesterday morning, Sunday morning, I returned after a full night of instruction to ethnic groups. When I was addressing Negroes, I was a Negro as black as the ace of spades, and I'm talking to Negroes. When I addressed the Oriental, I was an Oriental. When I addressed the Caucasian, I was a Caucasian. And yet I am not white, yellow, or black. I am spirit. But to be seen, I had to wear the form of man and wear a pigment acceptable to those I addressed. So here I am, black as the ace of spades, speaking to Negroes, and then I am blonde, speaking to Caucasians, and again, I am the Oriental, speaking to Orientals. I came back as gently upon the eyelids as Blake, in that 60th plate, tells us, I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes. I could actually feel the contact upon this dungeon, this iron mill, and then I spent maybe five minutes just reveling in all that I knew I brought back and what I had done. Then I got up and went about my chores for the day. So these words are not idle words with Blake. One day you'll experience them. One day you'll awaken from the dream of life. And you'll know that you are God the Father. You will know it by a series of events. You can't alter them. Don't try to change them. They will actually unfold in you. They will erupt like a flower erupting on the bush. And the whole thing will reveal you as the being that you have been seeking throughout the ages the being called Jesus Christ or God the Father. But it does not offend man when you speak of the human imagination, because all admit they do imagine. They may never be that courageous to identify their own wonderful human imagination with God, but I tell you, the day will come when you will be forced to identify Him and actually interchange a term. The God and your own wonderful human imagination are one and the same, they are not two. You put it to the test. Well, all right. You put it to the test. You know what you want. Well, dare this night to assume that you have it and sleep in the assumption that you have it. In that assumption will slowly harden into fact. That will harden into fact, just as Sam's hardened into fact. For God is emerging in the direct line of descent from us. When we read the genealogy of Christ, that is a direct line of descent from us. Slowly, painfully, but surely, he is weaving himself on us. And who is he? Your wonderful human imagination. My wonderful human imagination. That's the immortal you that comes out. Comes right out of this strange, wonderful line of descent. When it comes out, it's not anything that you see here. It's an immortal being. A body that is altogether different. You are then spirit, for flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15.50 
so that which comes out can inherit the kingdom of God. But this cannot, for this is a corruptible body. This is a body that is excrementitious. I certainly don't want a body of this nature forever, of bondage and slavery. For here is a body that no matter how much I have in this world, I could have all the wealth in the world and I cannot command any slave of mine to perform the normal functions of this body for me. I've got to do them all by myself. No money in the world can buy that service. The man who wears such a body has to perform the normal natural functions of that body all by himself or simply give it up. If he ceases to perform them, well then it means his exit from this world for he can't command anyone to perform them for him. So these bodies are certainly not bodies that you think of that you'd want to have throughout eternity. For the body you'll have, the immortal body, is your own wonderful human imagination. And you can't describe it. It is spirit. It's a protean being, and by that I mean I can assume any shape, as I did all through Saturday night. I woke on Sunday morning knowing that I'd played the part of the Caucasian, the Oriental, and the Negro teaching the Word of God. I was just that body. That was the mask that I wore, and I was received by these ethnic groups as their teacher clothed in a garment just like theirs. But the being that was masked by the body, no one saw him, for that one was spirit, pure spirit. Now, a friend of mine wrote me this letter. He says, I came back from a vast, vast section of space and time, and for one short interval encountered a fish and the fish was standing erect on its tail in what you would call a hand, its flipper, its right flipper or the right fin. It held a fishing rod, and it looked at me so intently. It conveyed the thought to me, I never lose a man that I go after. I catch everyone that I see. Then I had a flash that it was all past history, as though through the ages he had been fishing for me and I had been the hound of heaven. I'd been running, running away, but he was infinitely patient and he the great fish would one day catch him well this being who wrote the letter i must tell him that the fish has always been the symbol of jesus christ to this day you will find it on the crown of the pope the sign of pisces always on the crown of the pope the great fish he is called so a protean being it was he clothed as the fish speaking to himself for he really is in search of self not in search of another Everyone is in search of self, and that self is God the Father. That being that appeared before him clothed as the fish symbolized what he is searching for. But he got the impression no matter how he tries to escape, he will never escape this one. He will always get him. So in the end, you get him. And I would say from this vision, he isn't far from being caught. Now, a lady wrote, she said, you're supposed to close on Friday the 30th. And she sent this lovely Christmas card from both she and her husband. She said, on Thursday morning, on the 19th, I heard your voice distinctly. And you were calling to everyone who comes to your meetings on Mondays and Fridays, telling them not to come on Friday the 20th, for you would not be there. You kept on calling to all the regulars, and I was so impressed. I went to the telephone and picked up the receiver to call. You know, I said, this is stupid. Neville will think me insane. And I put down the receiver. I still heard the voice. I could not shut it out, and you were eager to call the regulars. Again, I went to the telephone, and again, I restrained the impulse, thinking you might think me stupid. So again, I didn't do it. Just imagine my chagrin when I came on Friday and was told you would not be there, that you were unwell, that you had the flu. And so you didn't come the closing night, and I knew all day Thursday that you would not be there because I heard your voice calling all the regulars not to come. If you could only test and trust completely trust this inner being one day you will one day you will trust it you will need no phone you'll be so intuitive your every thought that radiates from a seeming other for in the end you will know that all that you behold though it appears without it is within in your imagination of which this world of mortality is but a shadow blake so here this mystery of imagining as Fawcett said, it is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which the mystic aspires for supreme power, supreme wisdom, supreme delight lie in the far off solution of this mystery. Now notice he uses three definitions of power, 
wisdom, and delight. And these are the three defined in Scripture that define Christ. Paul speaks of Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24. In the eighth chapter of Proverbs, they speak of Christ as the delight of God. He was with him constantly, delighting before him always, delighting in the affairs of men. He who finds me finds life. He who misses me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Verse 35. So this that you heard this night, if it is denied by you or ignored, it's because you're in love with the world of death. Everything here dies, but everything in the world begins and ends. It all dies, but Christ lives forever. Those who hate him, it's because they're in love with death. And they'll build up enormous fortunes, bigger and bigger, and have to leave it behind them. They haven't found a way yet of taking it. They'll leave their little garment and leave their funds no matter what size it is. But this, you can't leave behind. If you find him here, you found him, and death means nothing to you. Then, for you are one with what the world speaks of as Christ. One day you will know him. You will have all the experiences recorded in Scripture concerning Jesus Christ. You'll be cast in the central role, and then you will know beyond all doubt who you really are. You will have found him not as another. You will have found him as yourself. So some find him because they seek him. Others find him because they're brought to him by one who found him. And so some here this night, you didn't seek him, but you've been exposed to him. You may not accept it. You may go out and think that's blasphemy, what that man said tonight, because it's in conflict with your concept of what you think it ought to be. But I tell you from experience, I'm not speculating. I'm not theorizing, for I'm telling you I know what I know from experience. I have experienced the entire drama as recorded in Scripture concerning Jesus Christ, from the resurrection through the birth up to the very descent of the dove, the grand baptism. So everything recorded and all the outstanding events of his life I have experienced while walking in this little mortal frame. The frame is not exempt from all the bugs of the world. So a hundred million Americans got it. I was one of them. And so they burned and so did I. Five days of intense fever where you melt. So you take off 12 pounds and you do it certainly the hard way. You can consume all the liquids of the world. Weight still isn't going to remain on you. Off it goes. At the end of your little episode, you are weak, physically weak. And someone will say, well, if you are really the one that you claim and you've had all these experiences, then why? They do not realize that I do not consider the sufferings of the present time worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in me. Romans 8.18 I'm not exempt from anything that man is heir to, and man is heir to all the nonsense of the world. It is all within us, I know. So here, this night, the mystery of imagination is simply the mystery of your own being. It's the mystery of God. The more you discover the workings of your own imagination, the more you discover the secret of God. So don't put it aside. When you go home tonight, be perfectly honest with yourself. Do you know what you want either for yourself or for another? Do you really know? Well then, do what Sam did. Persuade yourself that things are as you desire them to be. To the degree that you are self-persuaded that they are so, to that degree they will become so, and they will externalize themselves in your world. For these assumptions, though at the moment that I make them, are denied by my senses, if persisted in, will harden into fact. So before you say no to it, test it. When you prove it in performance, you have found Christ. Now, do not do what my brother-in-law did. He buried the book. 
and forgot it. The same family, a friend of mine who is now gone from this world, said to me, Neville, wouldn't you like me to put Vicky in the social register in New York City? I said, certainly not. Well, she said, it's the most marvelous thing for her. I said, let Vicky make that decision. She's a child now and she can't possibly make that decision. And I might be doing her a great injustice. So I said, no, Helen, thank you very much. I presume you're in it. She said, well, when I was born, I was registered in it and all my children, three of them and my husband, my second husband, he came over and I got him into it. So we're all in the social register, my entire background. So it's easy for me to get Vicky in the social register. So I declined. Well, casually, I said to Cynthia, Sam's wife, I think a month later, and she said, you think she would sponsor me? I said, why not? I'll ask her. So I called Helen and said, Helen, my sister-in-law, Bill's sister, would like to be in the social register. She said, certainly, Neville. I'll get her in. That book is so prominently displayed in her living room that you can't miss it. They leave it there. It's all over the living room and quite casually open at the page. She loves that sort of life. Naturally, she's not going to take the story, which is the true story. For that thing in the social register isn't true at all. Yes, that she graduated from Smith, that her husband graduated from Harvard. These are true. But I mean the phoniness surrounding the whole thing. But the story I told concerning his use of Christ, that is the true story. And you'll find it if the book is not out of print called The Power of Awareness. That's where I tell the story. So when I go to bed tonight, instead of just sleeping as you do normally, dare to assume things are as you desire them to be and try to catch the mood that would be your mood were it so. Try to catch the feeling of the wish fulfilled and then sleep. Tomorrow night, do the same thing. The next night, do the same. And while you are sleeping, this immortal you will be pulling every wire in the world that is necessary to bring to birth your assumption. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by question and answers, as we will do now. Now let us go into the silence. Question. In Luke regarding the unclean spirit that comes out of man, I don't understand it. Neville says, when the unclean spirit has been cast out of man, this is a disembodied idea, for a demon is not some disembodied spirit. It's a prejudice, a superstition, a false pride. All these bedevil man. And so you entertain one and you're going to get two. You get seven and they never stop there. 
You start with one superstition and all of a sudden you have a thousand of them. But they have to have a man as the agent to express themselves. They can't express themselves without a man. Man is the agent that expresses all unlovely things in the world. These unclean spirits. So in my brother-in-law's case, it was false pride. And so he entertained this false pride that he went to Harvard. All right, so what? And then he was a banker. All right, wonderful. And now he's in the social register. He won't tell you that I got him there at the same time I declined for my daughter. She's never expressed any opinion since that, that she wanted it. I told her afterwards that I said no to it, that you, when you get old enough to know what's in this world, you may decide you want it and that it's always there for you if you want it. So the water displaces it. It passes through and it must go back to a man. So the idea goes back to Sam. He got the job. He knows exactly how he did it. And now he puts it behind him and denies the ladder by which he did ascend. So the demons returned all the false pride. He will think he's doing a wonderful job for God on Sunday morning. And there he is every Sunday morning, regardless of weather, as the head usher ushering all the ladies and gentlemen down to their pews. And he thinks he's doing God a service. He knows nothing of God. They'll sing all the hymns, get on their knees and pray to what? Certainly not to any God, for the only one that you could ever know is the God that you know in the first person present tense. You'll know him within yourself, and his name is I Am. That is his eternal, immortal being, so you'll know him. When you go outside and turn to a false god, you'll never find him. When you start with one idol, you multiply it. So these are the demons spoken of in scripture. You have a superstition. You can't stop at one. Were you ever in the theater? There you find them by the millions. Can't whistle in your own room. Can't put your shoe above where your head would be. Can't open an umbrella in the place and multiply them. Talk about the superstitions. Go into the theater. And I'm not fooling. They make you go outside and do all kinds of nonsense. If you absent-mindedly whistle in your own dressing room or do any of these silly little things, but they really believe it brings bad luck, and to the degree that they are self-convinced that it does, it does. So these are the demons that possess the mind of man. And certainly false pride is a frightful demon. I must be seen with what I call the proper people, and I can't be seen in certain areas, certain restaurants, and certain this, that, and the other, because it isn't the thing to do. Well, that's false pride. Question? Like Jean Dixon? You know who she is. Yes, I've heard of her. Question, okay, she prophesizes, like she gets these messages. Don't you think it's her imagination that when she thinks something dire is going to happen and says that it's why it happens because she has imagined it? Is that the way it works? Neville says, first of all, she's not a woman of vision. She's not a woman who actually has the vision of scripture but she can become self-persuaded using any little technique. She can use cards, use stars, use monkey bones, and to the degree that she is self-persuaded that these things mean what she thinks they do, well, to that degree, they'll come to pass. But you never hear them tell you of their mistakes. For instance, we had two candidates running for the presidency. All right, you can tell them both secretly that you're going to be president. One has to be, so you're 50% right. Well, that's such a major thing, but you're also 50% wrong. But you don't talk about that. Only talk about that which has been publicized. Question, how do we shorten the time period? Neville says, I would call it intensity of feeling. If you can feel the mood and become possessed by that mood, if I could only catch the mood, what would the feeling be like if it were true? Just what would it be like? will dwell upon just what it would be like. And suddenly, you're bathed in that mood. Now sleep in it. Your own wonderful human imagination is doing it. And one day, you least expect it, the same being is doing it. The same being that you exercised without beholding him will be beheld because you won't see him as another. You will see the events related only to him, and this time they are related to you, and then you will know who you are. Question inaudible. Neville says, When you find him, you are not in this dimension at all. It is not in this world at all. 
One day you'll discover that the story of Scripture is true, that in the end there is only one man, and all are gathered into one man, and you are that one man. God is not a being outside of us. God is a person, one man, as told us in Ephesians. There's only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. 4.4 four. So in the end, there is really only one. Here is a universally diffused individuality gradually being gathered together, one by one, into one body, one spirit, one Lord. So you will not be some little thing. You will be the actual body after the journey. And it's a terrible journey. No one denies the journey in this world is a horrible journey journey. No matter how luscious a life may be, there must come in the lives of all those moments when you are sad. You must say goodbye to your mother, your father, your husband or wife or child through the gate of death, and you are left behind to mourn. Well, if you don't have a heart, then you can take it. When you love someone dearly, it's difficult to say goodbye. Because clothed as you are in these garments of flesh and blood, you miss the physical contact you miss the voice. You miss the touch. You miss everything about the one you loved dearly. And you're kidding yourself if you say you don't miss them. You don't do it that way. Not if you have a heart. Question inaudible. Neville says, I have your faith is your fortune coming out in about two weeks. That's been out of print for years. And now I have one of the five books. It's called Resurrection. And they are out of print, four of them for years. Well, my friend bought it back and I added one chapter rather long. I call it a book, a small book, and it bears the title of that new one called Resurrection. So there are four that are out of print plus the one that's new. And now your faith is your fortune will be in. I think the publication is the 16th and divorce tells me that it will be ready by the 16th of this month. No, it is not revised. They couldn't use the old plates because they're worn out. That book has gone away beyond what I thought. I always thought it went 70,000. It's well over 100,000 that it sold, and they use the same plates, but the plates are so completely worn, it had to set from the beginning to the very end. So he has placed it differently, and it's not such a crowded page. It has wider spaces, so it's a much bigger book in appearance, but the identical content. Well, until next time, we'll be here on Monday. Thank you. Good night. And that concludes the mystery of imagination. I'm super excited about this new book of lectures that I found, The Return of Glory. Should have known about it a long time ago, but inside of it, there are some really amazing lectures. And Neville just continues to amaze me with the vast entire scope of his lectures. I mean, he's talked about so many different things so many different topics in such a relatable and interesting way. I feel like I know him. When I have these lectures, it's interesting because I have this little moment afterwards where Neville's sitting there with me. He'll talk to me. A month ago, he was like, you know, you're kind of repeating yourself. You need to find something better. And then I was guided today to find this. So I do feel like he's with me and he's with you. And as he says, he appears to you in whatever form. He had this dream where he was teaching people in different ethnicities, appearing as the Oriental or the Latino. We get an interesting expansion on the story about his brother-in-law and how he used his imagination to get a better job. I remember the story in The Power of Awareness and it's interesting to get more of the behind the scenes story here. I enjoy that. I enjoy these little additions that we get to the information that we've had so far. And I relate to his story about denying Christ, the person that has their dreams fulfilled, but is not willing to admit how they did it. They're not willing to say, I was able to do this because I used my imagination they fall back into their old patterns. And that is, as he describes, it's a denial of where your true power came from, as it's discussed in the Bible. I have denied my imagination. I've had things happen and I had imagined them. And then I've said, oh, it must've been just happenstance or it was just an accident, something that happened. 
And I was denying that the Christ within me, my imagination, had been behind it all along. It took me a long time to understand that. It took me a long time. So I will return to a couple more lectures from this period and from this book. Hopefully we can expand on this a little bit more. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out the Neville Goddard playlist. There's some amazing lectures we've already gone over. You can find my art at www.newearth.art. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.